मेरा सहारा बस हर तू हो गया मैं हो गया तन बस लौट कर आए गदरिया से तू आखिर कब तक लौट कर आए गदरिया से तू आखिर कब तक मुंतजर खैम के दर पर है सकीना बास कोई भी अब न रहा मेरा सहारा बास है ये अंदाज जब तेरी अलमदारी का है ये अंदाज जब तेरी अलमदारी का हाथ कटवा के अलम को किया ऊँचा कोई भी अब न रहा मेरा सहारा बास तूने वो काम किया जिसकी नहीं कोई मिसाल तूने वो काम किया जिसकी नहीं कोई मिसाल नहर से कोई भी प्यासा नहीं लौटा बास कोई भी अब न रहा मेरा सहारा बास होके भाई भी पुकारा नहीं भाई मुझको होके भाई भी पुकारा नहीं भाई मुझको जिंदगी भर मुझे तूने कहा खा जिंदगी भर मुझे तूने कहा खा कोई भी अब न रहा मेरा सहारा बास पानी पहुँचा न खया मैं शाह दी तक लेकिन पानी पहुँचा न खया मैं शाह दी तक लेकिन तुझको सब कहते हैं सखा सकीना बास कोई भी अब न रहा मेरा सहारा बास लाश अबास तरप जाती ती मखतल में सही लाश अबास तरप जाती ती मखतल में सही रोके जब के ते ते सरवर मेरे भैया बास कोई भी अब न रहा मेरा सहारा बास खत्म तू हो गया मैं हो गया तन बास इस्लाम का शबाब है अब्बास का 
एक जोर बू तुराब है अब्बास का अलाम इस नाम की हयात है अब्बास की वफा और रूह खिलाब है अब्बास का और रूह है खिलाब है अब्बास का क्या पूछते हो मुझसे बला अज मत हर रुख से लख जवाब है अब्बास का अला मश के सकीना सिर्फ निशानी थी प्यास की बच्चों का इज तरा है अब्बास का बच्चों का इज तराब है अब्बास का हर दौर के यजीद तुझे ये पता नहीं तेरी के इन खिलाब है अब्बास का तेरी के इन खिलाब है अब्बास का बो बला से ताब अब देर में कर बो बला से ताब अब देर में हर जुर्म जवाब है अब्बास का हर जुल्म का जवाब है अब्बास का मश के सकीना सिर्फ निशानी थी प्यास की बच्चों का इज तराब है अब्बास का इस नाम का जवाब है पर मोहम्मद वाल मोहम्मद सलावाद Uh, we will be starting the program uh, just shortly. Uh, please hold tight. Salawat.
اکبر محمد وعال محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم بارے دیگر صلوات جب ردا سے سے چھنی میں صدا دیتی رہی تو نایا جب ردا سے سے چھنی میں صدا دیتی رہی تو نایا غازی عالم ران کہا اور زندان کہا یہ بہن قید ہوئی تو نایا غازی ہم کو پانی نہ ملے تیری خوشبو تو رہے تیرے بازو نہ کٹے چاہے مشکی زچ دے یہ مگر ہو نہ سکا تیرے بازو ہے جدا مجھ پہ ہے تش نہ لبی تو نایا غازی آگئی شام علم لٹ گئے اہل غرم ریت پر جلتی ہوئی ہو گیا تھنڈا علم پرسہ دینے کے لیے مجھ سے ملنے کے لیے آگئے بابا علی تو نایا غازی کیا کہوں شیر میرے بے ردا ہم کو لیے یہ مسلمہ سارے شہر در شہر گئے خلقت کوفہ کبھی خلقت شام کبھی اور غاہم پہ ہسی تو نایا غازی جب ردا سے سے چھنی میں صدا دیتی رہی تو نایا غازی آل امران کہا اور زندان کہا یہ بہن قید ہوئی تو نایا غازی جب ردا سے سے چھنی میں صدا دیتی رہی تو نایا 
غازی محمد و عالم محمد صلوات Bear with me for quick announcements. Tonight, Alami Hazrat Abbas salam will be taken out after the English Majlis. So, then it will be sent downstairs in the ladies' old building, in the ladies' hall in the old building for ziyarat. Tomorrow night, we will have the Taabut Hazrat Ali Akbar salam after the English Majlis. The, it goes same, it will be sent downstairs in the old building for ladies for ziyarat. Urdu program Ziyarat schedule will stay intact as it's been announced before. Taburuk will be served both after the English and the Urdu Majalis. Stream, streaming will also be, will also be doing the streaming in the newer hall in, uh, for Maulana Ali Abbas Rezavi. And Urdu Majlis will start right after Maulana Ali Abbas Rezavi will finish his speech. For Muhammad Wali, Muhammad Salawat. Tonight during the majlis, we'll take a pause for five minutes to do our annual donation drive. We're looking forward for your generous donation to cover the expenses incurred during the Ayami Aza. So we'll just take maybe five minutes during the majlis with Molana's permission. Day of Ashura schedule is very packed. It will start at 4.20 a.m. with majlis Azani Ali Akbar. It will go all the way to Shami Gariba starting with namaz e at 7 p.m. Without any further ado, I'll, I'll request Maulana Sayyid Ali Abbas Razavi to the member. With the same setup, please, adults on the stage and uh, children with, their, uh, with the adult supervision. But Muhammad Wali Muhammad Salawat. I'm going to invite all of you to just come forward. Salah Salawat, please. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ya Allah salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى لبيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين أضحب الله عنهم ورجسه وطهرهم تزهيرا أما بعد قال الله الحكيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وإن من شيئته أهل إبراهيم صدق الله العلي العظيم Allah, 
our series of discussions are slowly coming to an end now. It's amazing how. some of the brothers at the back if you are coming in then please just come in quickly because it's disturbing the rest of the brothers which I sell out please for all the brothers who are just at the back if you come to the front as you know last night three holes filled up and then people were standing outside so for, so that in 20 minutes when it does fill up if you guys who are over the age of 18 if you can come all the way to the front please is that another salawat please she was saying that these nights are slowly leaving us it feels like we're visitors in these nights. We start off with the moon of Muharram coming. And there's an anticipation that for many weeks we've been waiting for that to come. And what's amazing is that how we begin to feel. On the one hand you feel sadness, but the other hand you feel happiness. It's almost that there's a connection there with Sayyid al-Shuhada that these 10 nights bring about. And as these nights begin to go night after night, night after night. It's as if there's a heavy feeling that falls upon the heart of the believer. The last three nights are very critical, especially for those people who truly want to understand the message and the movement of Hussein. A foundation was laid in Karbala. That foundation starts in Karbala, but the caravan ends with the coming of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. It is an evolution that takes place, a movement that takes place. Those companions that Sayyid al-Shuhada had, no one has had those type of companions. From the beginning of time, from Adam to Khatam, nor did our Prophet have those companions, nor did Amir al-Mu'mineen have those companions, nor did Imam Hassan have those companions. But you know what the tradition says? It says the only other person who will have those companions is your master who is willing to come, waiting to come, about to come. This is why they say, they say, train your youth, train your youth with akhlaq, train your youth with morality, train your youth with education. The reason being is this, that the movement of the 12th Imam, according to the Ruayat, is not a movement of elders, it's a movement of youth. It's a movement of youth. You know why? You don't know who's sitting here. Maybe that five-year-old boy in front of me, seven-year-old boy in front of me, he's the next Malik al -Ashtar. you don't know it. Allah hides these people for the day to come. Well, then they show their colors that this is Malik. This is why when people ask, they say, well, we've got hundreds of Ayatollahs. How comes the whore of the Imam doesn't come? Allah doesn't want hundreds of Ayatollahs. Allah wants one Salman. He wants one Abadhar. He wants one Miqdad. He wants one Ammar. These are the people that need to come forward. These are the people who are being cultivated at the moment. The biggest responsibility at this moment for anyone is the mothers. Why? because the first university of any child is the cradle of the mother. This is why we say, educate your daughters in the best possible way. 
go against what happened a hundred years ago when people refused to educate women. The empowerment of women is important. Had it not been for women, Karbala wouldn't have taken place. Right? Why do you think that Imam Hussein waits until the time he does to leave towards Karbala? Shall I tell you why? It is mustahab for a baby that for seven days that baby doesn't come out. On the seventh day when Ali Yasghar was born, after he was born, then Imam Hussein said, now let's go. Meticulously, he waited for every individual to come. And every individual came in the time that they came. Amir al-Mu'mineen's dua, Imam Hassan's patience, Imam Hussein's patience, waiting for that moment when the 72 were complete. When were they complete? When a baby came in the world, seven days old. Imam says the sunnah has been completed. He says, now let's go towards Karbala. Look at the meticulous nature of the Imam. Your Imam, your Imam, this living Imam is like that as well. He waits meticulously for that time when this child or that child or that child grows. This is why. Movement of the Imam is what? Movement of the Imam is a movement of the heart. If you look at Salman, if you look at Abadhar, if you look at Meqdad, what is the one quality that they had above everything else? They weren't barbarians. You look at your Imam, you think of your, the way that we describe our Imam sometimes, come sword, this, that, the other. It's not the way of the Imam. The actual way of the Imam is the way of the Imam which changes hearts of the people. The actual way of the Imam is the way that the Imam changes the what? The being of an individual. He brings hearts down to his feet. That's how it is. This is why they say that the first people who are going to come to the Imam don't necessarily need to be Muslims. Remember, the entire world is waiting for a Messiah to come. Look at Judaism today. Look at the way that they're waiting for the anointed one to come. Look at Christians today. Look at the feeling of the messianic era that's been predicted. We as Shias are different from any other denomination in Islam. And the reason being is this, that we do not believe in death and destruction that needs to take place. We don't believe in these apocalyptic traditions to take place. We are those people who believe in truth and justice that needs to take place. But more importantly, truth and justice with love needs to take place. You know, remember, if you want to change the hearts of people, if you want to bring people towards truth, and if you want to bring people towards justice, you know the biggest problem today is? The biggest problem today is the akhlaq of people, the morality of people, right? That's what needs to change. When that morality changes, then everything else changes. The first step for morality to change, as we said in the last couple of nights, is when you begin to look through the lens of someone else. Remember, what else did we say? We gave a hadith. There were two qualities to that hadith. One quality is this, Salat al-Rahim. If you truly believe that you are a follower of your Imam, then the first thing you need to do is to sort out the affairs that you have with your people, with your family, with your parents. Whether you're Muslim, whether you're non-Muslim. Whether your mother is a Muslim, whether your mother is a Kafir. Whether your mother is so-and-so, whether your mother is so It doesn't make a difference. The fact of the matter is this, whether your mother and father are good people or bad people, in your opinion, you have a responsibility first and foremost as Shias of the Imam to do Silat al-Rahim. Go out there, spread your hand towards them and make sure you show them love and affection. That's what's most important. Now today, ask yourself the question, how many Shias sitting in here have good relationship with their brothers? How many Shias sitting here have good relationships with their children? You know what happens? As a father, you say, arrogantly well my son should come to me and say salam and do you know if you have that mind frame what happens 40 years will go by and you and your son will be separated you will be suffering he will be suffering you will be in depression he will be in depression you know there's three things that happen when a person cuts contact with their mother their father their children or their brothers and sisters first thing they fall into depression depression takes place peace of the heart goes this is why, you know, Adab of Allah, people talk about the fact that, oh, in the time of Musa, in the time of Isa, Adab of Allah came down, seven plagues came down, this happened, that happened. In this day and age, how comes there's no Adab? Shall I tell you something, brothers? The biggest Adab is when the peace of the heart goes. Even in that plague, Bani Israel were happy because Musa was there. Even in trial and tribulation, people still knew that Nuh is there, Adam is there, your prophets are there, Yaqub is there, Yusuf is there. But today, when the peace of the heart goes, then what's going to happen? The biggest trial and tribulation for any human being is when the peace of the heart goes. When you feel depressed, when you don't know which direction to turn to. Ask yourself a question. Most of the time is self-inflicted. So the first thing that we need to do as followers of the Ahlul Bayt is what? Salat al-Rahim. Make sure that your 
responsible human beings that you're working hard for your parents, for your family. Second thing is this, though, as we've mentioned, the idea that take care of your neighbor. You live in a country where your neighbor could be green, blue, black, yellow, different languages, different colors. What is your responsibility? And I say this for a reason. Your responsibility is not to look at religion, not to look at race, not to look at culture. But the fact is this, your responsibility is to take care of whoever your neighbor is, regardless of what they are, regardless of which color they are. Today, when we live in the West, we have a responsibility to do outreach work. Let me ask you a question. How many Hindus have come into your center? How many Jews have come into your center? I'm sure many have come into your center, but there are many other centers across the world where no Hindu comes, where no Jew comes, where no Christian comes, where no atheist comes. When it's our responsibility to spread this message of Hussein from outside of these four walls or to take it outside. How are you going to take that message outside? The only way you can take it outside is if you open your doors up to say, come and see, we're very open, come and look at what we do. But you know what we say? We say, no, 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 najis and this and that and the other. If Rasulullah thought like that, you wouldn't find people coming into the mosque. Have you not heard of the story? When the Arab come in, starts urinating in the corner of the mosque, Masjid al-Nabawi, Sahabas are willing to just take him out. And Rasulullah says, look, leave him. He doesn't know. Man stops us, we can clean it up, we can make a tahir. He's urinating, fine, we can make a tahir. But you know what? The most important thing is to treat a person with good akhlaq. That person changed, why? Akhlaq of the Prophet. Now I'm not saying call a bunch of people in so that they can urinate in your center, it's not the case. What I'm saying though is look at the patience of the Prophet. The patience of the Prophet was such. T today what do we do? Right, what do we do? When somebody goes against our ideology, we badmouth them. You're seeing it. There's nothing hidden to you. Your WhatsApp, every day I guarantee you, there must be a WhatsApp badmouthing somebody else. The person who's badmouthing, right, can I ask them a question? Are you enemies of Islam or are you friends of Islam? Because only an enemy of Islam will slander a badmouth so I want to push them away. Amr bil ma'roof doesn't mean you push somebody away. Amr bil ma'roof means what? You show people with love and you bring them back. When people call other people names, and they call him, this person is this, and this person is that, and this guy is this, and this guy is that. What are you effectively doing? You're effectively pushing people away from the deen. You're effectively pushing. If you think that you're right and that person is wrong, if somebody swears at you, what are you going to do? You're never going to speak to him. You're going to turn your face away from him. So what have you done? If you believe you have the truth, then your akhlaq should be such that reflects the truth. You should never be a person who ever badmouths somebody. Imam Hussein goes to Karbala. You don't see him slandering Yazid. You don't see him bad-mouthing Yazid. You don't see him swearing at Yazid. You don't see him saying Yazid's an agent. But some of us Shia, we have believed that we have a license to Torma. We believe we have a license to Ghiba. I think we have a license. Why? Because no, because what I think is right. Believe me, if you think you're right, ulama in the past have had different opinions as well. But their intellectual differences never became dhati. Today, your intellectual differences on taqlid and other issues are becoming dhati. He's a fulan, she's a fulan, he's a fulan. Did you ever see Allama Hilli do that? Allama Majlisi was an akhbari. He was in a time when there were other scholars there as well. In the Safavi period, you had akhbaris, you had a suli sitting together, eating together. There was no issue. Their problem was with what? Intellectual difference. But it doesn't mean you bring it out and start fighting with one another. Saibi Hedaik, what is he? Akhbari. If you go to the Bathal, we used to go to the Bathal Kharaj of Ayatollah Tabrizi. Most of his lessons at one stage was from Sahib Hidayak, referencing him, Akhbari. Go and look at your biggest book, one of the biggest books in the second, second part, Wasail al-Shia, Khura Amali, Akhbari. So what? Ayatollah Khuri Usuli. So what? What difference does it make? It's an intellectual discussion. It's for the ulama. You don't get involved in it. You don't know the Alif of Sarf and Nahav yet. Ulama sit there, they discuss with one another, they talk to one another. The biggest problem are the followers of the ulama and the maraja. They think they're holier than thou. Whenever you go to any marja, he gives respect to the other marja. Right? One of the brothers was telling me when he opened up an orphanage in Najaf, when he opened up an orphanage in Najaf, he went to Ayatollah Sistani. He said, Agha, we'll open up an orphanage in Najaf. He said, you're not an Iraqi, where'd you get the permission from? He replied, he said, Sheikh Bashir gave it to me. He said to me, Ayatollah Sistani puts his hand on his head and says, my brother has given you this orphanage. No. Right? My brother. That's the marajayat. 
whether they have ikhtilaf in other or whatever it may be, the fact is this, they believe that each other is brother. Today, we need to do the same thing. We need to make sure we may have a difference, but today we are brothers. Brothers may have problems, but the biggest thing is this, brothers need to sit down together and eat together. Learn something from Ibrahim alayhi salam. Learn something from your brothers, the Jewish people, when they sit down on Sabbath. Regardless of what problem they have as a family, they sit down and they eat together. That's profound. Take those things which are sunnah to Ibrahimi. Why? Because we're also part of the Abrahamic faiths. Your prophet teaches more than that. What does your prophet say? He says, eat together. He says, travel together. He says, live together. You may have problems with one another, but be the first to go and give salam and be the first to reconcile. Put your egos to one side. Otherwise, these are the problems that are seeing you. Do you think any of your maraja want you to be fighting? What did Ayatollah Sistani say last year? What did he say? Look at his statements. He's asking for you guys to resolve your differences. Your marja doesn't need to do that. Your marja has more responsibility on his shoulders than to ask you to reconcile your differences. As the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, what do we need to do? We love those people who love the Ahlul Bayt. So what does that mean? That means if anyone here calls themselves a follower of the Ahlul Bayt, if we have an ikhtilaf with them, we should remove negativity from their heart for the sake of the Ahlul Bayt. Right? That's something that we need to do. This is the only way we can change. People say that we don't feel a connection when we go to the haram of the imam. Obviously, you're not going to feel a connection. You've got bughd against a hundred other people. Amir al-Mu'minin is saying to you, remove the bughd. You're saying, Mala, you know, but I've been wronged. What makes you special from anybody else? We talk about it, right? We say to our people, you know, you should remove negativity. But when it comes to you, you say, but no, my case is different. Because why is your case different? What makes you different? All of our cases are the same. So let's remove it. It's not that difficult. You know why? When you're doing it for a higher presence, you know the higher presence is going to reward you. If tomorrow you turn around and you say, for the sake of Zahra alayhi salam, because I know she wants it. Because I know that she wants me to remove all that negativity in my heart. If you were to do that tomorrow and just say salam to somebody, do you honestly think that she's not going to reward you? Do you honestly think that her happiness is not there? Her happiness is there. She's going to reward us. She's going to bless us. What is the first stage though? First stage is this. Remove your own negativity. Look, you know what the tradition says? It says that there are five signs to a human being. Hadith I was looking at today. The five signs, regardless of whether they're kafir or Muslim. If they have these five signs, Allah will bless them. Allah will bless them. You know the first one is? Look at it and see. Good akhlaq. Good akhlaq is something that Allah will reward. I'll give you a story. Qarun, heard of him, right? You know Allah didn't punish him in this world for a very long time. Qarun. One hadith says the reason why I didn't do it. Look at the hadith. He says one day Qarun was going for an area. He wanted to check up on Yunus. At that stage, Yunus had been eaten by the whale. In the stomach of the whale, Yunus is reciting tasbih. Now, Qarun was a man who was also pumped with ulum al-gharibah. Remember, all of these guys have gone off the track. If you look at some of the traditions, Namrud, Fir'aun, they were not ordinary people. Namrud believed in Tawheed. Fir'aun believed in Tawheed. The difference was this. That's what makes him even worse. You have many tyrants in the world. But the fact is, the biggest tyrant is the one who had some level of understanding and then he went. Why does shaitan commit one deed and he goes into this direction? Shaitan commits one deed because he had a level of knowledge. He was raised. In the same way, if you look at the power of Namrud, Namrud had power. If you look at him, he was performing magic, so to speak. Look at Fir'aun, look at these individuals in the time of the Bani Israel. They were people who were, had a particular understanding. Why did they become what they became? Because remember, when a person gets to a level and then he falls, he falls harder. A person's an idiot, doesn't make a difference. Tomorrow he repents, that's fine, his intellect was this big. But if a person's intellect is like that and he's using it for wrong, this is why they say, when an alim is corrupted, the entire nation becomes corrupted. And then when Allah takes his revenge on that alim, then there's nobody who can stop it. Why is that? Why is that? Because he's come to an understanding, right? Qarun says to one of his muakils, he says, take me to Yunus. He says, fine, a muakil takes him, takes him into the belly. 
he asks him a question. Question is asked about who? Musa and Harun and Yusha, right? Harun's going there and just meeting him and building that. Allah delayed his trials and tribulations coming upon him. Delayed it. Remember, if it can be done on a person, look at it and see. There's a cause and effect in this world. There's a cause and effect. Many other time in the history you find that people are not the very best of people. But Allah delays punishment. The reason being is because he likes a particular action of this. One of those actions is, as we said, Salat al-Rahim. Thy neighbor. But remember, there are five qualities. One of them is what? Ghayra. When a person has ghayra, Allah likes that. There's an honor there. Honor there. Ghayra doesn't mean arrogance, by the way. People take it as arrogance. Ghayra means there's an honor. I'll give you an example. You see somebody's wife walking. You have a ghayra there. What do you do? You give her the respect. You give her the protocol. You know, put your head down. You make sure that she's okay. Somebody's mother is walking there. Treat her as your mother. Whether they're Muslim or Christian or Jew, it doesn't make a difference. You help them cross the road. They've got, they've got something in their hand. They can't carry it properly. You help them carry it properly. Why? This is ghayra. Right? This is part of ghayra. Ghayra also is what? Part of ghayra means that you're very, very... You show that ghayra, that honor when it comes to the Ahlul Bayt. When it comes to what the Ahlul Bayt say, there's a ghayra that's implemented. Tonight is the night of Abu Fadl Abbas, right? You can't have more ghayra than Abbas. At least take a lesson back from him. Take a lesson back from him. One of them is ghayra. One of them is having good akhlaq. What does good akhlaq mean? Good akhlaq doesn't mean being f fake with people. Maybe people shake hands, smile, and they kiss each other on the cheeks. But then after that, the riba that takes place, the negativity that takes place. You know, I remember a great mystic by the name of Ayatollah Langrudi. I spent time with him myself, so I knew him in this way. I was very young then, but I spent time with him. You know, one of the beauty of this man was, he's passed away now, but the beauty of this man died in 2006. One brother died in November 2005, the other one, I think, in February or March 2006. One of the beauties of this man was that even if a person insulted him, the minute that man left, he never spoke about anyone who left, whether positively or negatively. And when he asked the question, why not positively? The reply is very simple. We start talking about somebody positively for one minute, then for the next 30 minutes, you butcher him. What happens? So what is our responsibility then? Our responsibility is very simple. Akhlaq. Akhlaq means you attract people to yourself. What is the purpose of the Prophet? Ask yourself. Ibrahim teaches us monotheism. Ibrahim taught us monotheism, Tawheed. Musa gave us Sharia. 90% of our Sharia is the same as the Sharia of Musa. Right? Isa taught us spirituality. What's the purpose then of our Prophet? Question can be asked. What is the purpose when everything else is there? Answer is very simple. The Prophet says, Inna ma ba'ithtu li utammima makaram al akhlaq purpose of that is what? Akhlaq is what makes you perfect, refines you. Human being without akhlaq is an animal. Akhlaq of a human being takes him to the ma'raj. What, what does it mean by polishing? What is makaram al-akhlaq? What is Imam Zain al-Abidin teaching you? Right? He's teaching you become like my jadha mir al-mu'mineen. Walk on the line of my jadha Rasulullah. Why? What is it? Akhlaq is what? Akhlaq is the names of Allah that you're shining in your own self. I'll give you an example. Allah is compassionate. Islam tells you to be compassionate. Allah is loving. Islam tells you to be loving. What are these names? Rahman, Rahim, Karim, Rauf. All of these names. Allah wants you to enact all of these names in your daily life. Enact all of these names. Why? And you can maybe enact two or three names. But you find when Amir al-Mu'mani enacts him, he enacts all of the names of Allah. Ahlul Bayt enact all of the names of Allah. So look, so what's the first thing? First thing is the ghayra. Second thing is good akhlaq. But what else is important? Man should be courageous. Human beings need to be courageous. What does courage mean? Courage doesn't mean you just jump off a cliff. What does courageous mean? You know the biggest courage? I'll tell you the biggest courage. In the face of sin, you're able to close your eyes. That is a man who's courageous. That is a man who's courageous. And Allah gives byproduct to people like that. You think for every action that you do, there's not a reaction? I'll give you a story. You know, somebody asked me a question today. Tell us about dream interpretation. I said, look, why don't you do it yourself so you can interpret dreams yourself? Three things. Look at it and see. Three things. If you can do these three things, you yourself will be able to interpret from Alam or Roya, whatever you want to. 
You know what the first thing is? First condition for a person to be able to interpret dreams, 100% is what? Truthfulness. Don't ever lie. Don't ever lie. One of the qualities of the five qualities that we're talking about is don't lie. They say a person who has the quality that they don't lie, they're truthful, regardless of who they are, Allah will bless them, whether they're Muslim or not. But the sign of a mu'min is that in the time when they're fearing something, they're truthful. It takes it that step forward. In the time when they're fearing, then they're truthful. Right? In the time when they're fearing, they don't turn their back on a middle mu'min. It's very simple to say, I love you until there's a problem. Then we see what your color is. Right? So one of those things, according to our traditions, on dream interpret, I was asked the question, the brother's here, I'm answering it. One thing is this, truthfulness. Byproduct of truthfulness is that. You know what the second thing is? Second thing is this, when you are tested with something like an indecency. I remember one of my teachers would say, he says, how did Ibn Sirin and other people like that develop the power to be able to tell and interpret Alim Roya? It was when, when, it, it dis, when there's an indecency which is there. Let's say, for example, somebody wants to commit zina with you and you turn your back when you walk away. That Allah gives jaza for. Second thing. You know what the third thing is? Third thing is as follows. Then they say the third condition, the third criteria is this. To recite Surah Yusuf. If a person recites that on a daily basis, and you know, our women are very good at that, especially when they're giving birth, they recite it. Carry it on in your life. You will see eventually it becomes a malika. When it becomes a malika, when these three things are there, you yourself don't need to go into any book or ask any alim. The minute that you see it, you'll be able to interpret it. Do you ever think about how the likes of Ayatollah Grami do istikhara? I remember I was sitting there once, some guy comes to Ayatollah Grami. He does the istikhara, the guy asks him what verse came out. I held my head. I said, you don't ask somebody like that. And you know, he's ill. So he replies and he goes, listen, I open up the Quran, the Barukan. The voice comes into my ears. Rest salawat, please. I get nervous when the management's on the stage. Shall I call them forward? If we can come forward, please, with the salawat. Just come forward. Right. We are. So we have what? Four now? Three now? I'll give you another one. Here it says, whether you're Muslim, non-Muslim, Allah will bless you if you have this other quality. What is that quality? Generosity. Any human being that has generosity, Allah will bless them. Through generosity, what happens? Life is increased. Problems are removed. Strange how it just kind of comes into play. But you know what the beauty is about generosity? If you're generous for the cause of the Ahlul Bayt, then not just one, but seven generations of yours benefit. God forbid a time comes in your life. God forbid a time comes when your mother is sick, when your child is sick, when your family is going through trial and tribulations. Why not be generous towards the cause of the Ahlul Bayt? I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Forget the majlis of Hussein. The rice that served for Hussein, that also has shafa. Right? Somebody gives money to just the tabarruk of Hussein. Imagine if they gave money to even the message of Hussein. I'll give you an example. Ayatollah Dasda Ghaib narrated a story once. One of my teachers was telling me. He said to me, look, Ayatollah Dasda Ghaib, when he was in Najaf, there used to be a man who used to come in Najaf. In Muharram time, he used to come, sit there, and he used to have a, sit at the back. In those days, they was, where there was smoke in the majlis, right? So he would sit there having a cigarette at the back. And you could tell he wasn't very interested. Maybe he was, but Ayatollah Dasda Ghaib thought he wasn't. And after that, he would just drink the tea and then he would go. 
So I told that they said to him, look, man, at least come for the majlis, man. Listen to it properly. You're just coming for the Rothmans and you're coming for the tea. So he says, look, just let me do what I'm doing. Saddam kicked him all out. They ended up in Qom. He said, I went to Hosseini Najaf here. Majlis finishes. Who's standing there next to the tea place? This guy again. He says, look, for God's sake. And Najaf, you were drinking teas. Here you're drinking tea. For God's sake, you know, at least listen to the majlis. He says, look, let me do what I'm doing. Thursday comes. Allama Dastaghe walks out. As he's going through Ghazar Khan, next to Masjid al-Fatimiyah, he sees a massive sign there. The sign said this person has passed away. He says, oh, Allah bless this person. Khuda rahmat al-shukudah, he's passed away. Rahmatullah, he's passed away. He says, that night he goes to sleep. When he goes to sleep, what does he see? He sees a massive palace which is there in his dream. So he looks up, he says, man, you know, I'm standing next to Mamlakat al Muhammad. This is probably Abu al-Fadl Abbas's palace. Let me go inside and see who's inside. As he goes inside, he sees that man again standing there with a tea in his hand. He goes, in this world, he didn't stop. In this world, come on, man. He looks up, he goes, you know whose palace this is? He says, no. He says, this is my palace. You're on my property. He says, how did you achieve this? He says, because with aqidah, I would come to drink the tea of Hussein. So I'm going to hold this discussion there. Your community, your Husseiniyah, is named after Imam Hussein. Had he not asked me, I wouldn't say this. This goes against my own principles to ever ask. I don't ask. You need to, it's a privilege for you to give for Imam Hussein. If you think that you're a follower of Imam Hussein, I don't need to ask. But because they've asked me, requested, and I'm a guest in your city, then I take their request. Whatever you have, whatever you can do, they're going to come out, they're going to collect for the center. Whatever you can give for the sake of Imam Hussein, you have two minutes to do that. Bismillah. As I said earlier, I would request our chairman, Brother Mehdi Mirza, and Brother Ali Hussain for our annual Ayame Adha donation drive. But Muhammad Wali Muhammad Salawat. Uh, while the f uh, volunteers pass out the form, I'm just going to take forms. I'm just going to take a minute uh, of your time, and I apologize for interrupting, but it's our uh, annual uh, fundraising drive for operations. So, on behalf of the Azadas attending IEC Husseini's uh, programs, would like to thank all the volunteers for their endless dedication for making this possible. Uh, also, want to thank all the community members for following the directions of the volunteers. And uh, we realize that we do have shortcomings, and we welcome your uh, suggestions and comments. And uh, we have volunteer opportunities, so if you're interested, please contact us. Uh, and uh, you know, once again, thank you for uh, supporting IEC in your, with, with your volunteer opportunity as well as uh, financially, because that's what makes it, uh, all these programs possible. Molana, with your permission. Assalamu alaikum, respected Momini and Mominat of IEC Husseini. I, being that this is a very important night and we are in, during, we are in the process of Majalis as I Imam Hussein alayhi salam, I will not take a lot of your time. What I do seek your cooperation. Um, I am a volunteer at IEC Husseini, such as Mahdi Bhai is, and a lot of the Mominin who function in various functioning capacities to help make sure the operations of this Imam Barga are proper and are working as fluid as possible for one reason and one reason only. For Azad Ali from Majlis says, I am Hamu Sana Alayhi Salaam, but Muhammad Wali Muhammad Salawat. Without going into a very long speech, uh, which I don't need to, we understand the significance of the night. Maulana Sayyid Ali Abbas Razavi Saab has stated very eloquently the importance of giving to the Imam Barga Imam Hussain Alayhi Salaam. As we do each year, let me get right to the point. Um, as a servant of Ayl Bayt al -Islam, a very meek person, my responsibility each year is to come and ask for money from Majlis Aizah Imam Hussain al -Islam. We are looking for 72 Mominin and Mominat who can contribute at least $500. Now, if you can contribute a sum that may be not be $500, that's fine. There's nothing, and that's great, in fact. But we are looking for 72 Mominin who could contribute $500. The funds collected, the cumulative funds collected, will be directly 
used from Majlisa as Imam Hussain al Salam. Salawat. The funds collected will not be used for capital expense. They will not be used to buy supplies. They will be used for Majlis al -Aza. That is what we are asking for. So as we do each year, we are asking for 72 Mominin. 72, if you are one of the 72, please raise your hand. Please raise your hand. One, mashallah. Two, three, four, five, the brother in the back, six, seven, eight. Volunteers, please recognize the brothers who are raising their hand and please provide them with a form. To, to our sisters downstairs, as you are doing this with us, please do the same. If you require a pen, our volunteers have the pen. We stopped off at the number eight. Can we continue? Can we continue? Nine, 10, 11, 12, thir brother needs a pen here onto, my le onto the left side, please. Brother, please continue to raise your hand so we can identify you. Just to give you, um, just to give you the strength of our community, um, the reason we are in this beautiful Imam Barga is because all of us got together, contributed, worked hard in whatever capacity we had to help build this beautiful Imam Barga, Imam Hussain al -Salam. There's nothing more gratifying than pulling in out of North Avenue and Glen Ellen Road to see this beautiful mosque that sits in front of us, beautifully lit. We, all of us working together, gave each other the opportunity to come here from Majlis -e Azah. Now we also, have a commitment to the commitment we already made, and that is to make sure operations are functioning, and with that, we require funds. Okay, can we continue the counts? 17, 18, 19. Volunteers, please recognize the brothers who are raising their hands and deliver the form. 20, 21, brother. If you could please, if you have not received a form and I've called and I've and I've referred to you, please keep your hands raised so we could uh, deliver the form to you. We need a form up front, please. Lastly, what I want is when I was referring to the strength of the Azadari in our community, um, each night at IEC Husseini, since our Imam Baga has expanded and is, and is an amazing facility, um, we within this facility have close to 14 to what will eventually be about 2,000. Azadars coming into the facility from Manjilis Aza each night. The more spectacular outreach of our program is each night on our global program network, and I say global because we have people logging into Manjilis Aza at Imam Hussein al Salam at IEC Husseini in South America, in Africa, all over Europe, and of course our favorite India and Pakistan, right? We're talking 1,000 to about 1,250 computers logged in each night. Each night from Majlis Sayyid Azai Imam Hussain al -Salam, there could be 3,000 Mominin watching with us. That is what this community, what you have helped this community grow into. An absolute premier Islamic education center that is recognized globally. And that is, uh, and that is uh, an accomplishment that we have all achieved. That is the power. Now let us continue. Do I see more hands? But Muhammad Wale Muhammad Salawat. Continuing on. Can I see at least four more Mominin raising their hands for contributions and to partake in 72? Four more. Four more. One, two, three, one more. Four. MashaAllah, MashaAllah. But Muhammad Wale Muhammad Salawat.
volunteers, I would like you to ask to please distribute the forms to my, to my brothers here on stage. Um, if you could please, on your forms, fill out your name, email, and phone number. Um, we, would like to, from, we would like to thank you for contributing to Majlis Sayyid Zayim Hamusan al Salam. We'd like to very sincerely thank you, Maulana Sayyid Ali Abbas Rezavi. Thank you for this opportunity, Maulana, and we apologize for any disruption in the Majlis. And my dear brothers and sisters, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your patience in listening to us. Um, please know that the volunteers here at IEC is anywhere here to serve you. And in whatever capacity that we could function to make your experience better, prom we promise you as the board of directors and the management staff that we will, inshallah. Now, please, let's continue with Manjil Asai Azai Imam Hussain alayhi salam, bar Muhammad wa Muhammad, salawat. May we please ask you to move forward as much as possible, please. Please help fill the voids that are before you. Please move forward as much as possible. If you need to rise and come forward, please feel free to do so as well. Uh, so we can continue Majlis Ayazai Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Bar Muhammad wa Muhammad salawat. Allah bless all of those people who are, in whatever way possible, contributing financially, physically, time-wise, to this message of Azhar. Know something. Names are written every Thursday for certain people who are doing certain good deeds. But names are also cut as well for certain people who don't live up to that expectation. I'll give you a story that Ayatollah Wahid al-Khurasani gave. I was listening to a story that he gave. He said that when I was younger, I would study under an ayatollah by the name of Sayyid Abdul Hadi Shirazi. Sayyid Abdul Hadi Shirazi, in any given time, trained, according to Ayatollah Wahid, Maraja, who he considers as knowledgeable. Now, it's very difficult for him to say to somebody that you're a mujtahid. So if you look at the Sanad of Ijtihad that is given, he gives it to very few people because he doesn't recognize many people. But he said that in those lessons we had people like Sayyid Ali Bahishti, people like say Sheikh Mirza Jawad Tabrizi. You had individuals like that sitting in the room. So he said that one day news had come that Sayyid Jafar, Sayyid Jafar Shirazi had passed away. Sayyid Jafar Shirazi was his wife's brother. So he passed away. So Ayatollah Wahid said, I came to Ayatollah Sayyid Abdul Hadi Shirazi, the Marja, and I said to him, look, you know, this is my condolences to you. And he said that I heard that Sayyid Jafar passed away. So he said to him, look, you know, I want to tell you something. He said, what? He said, I haven't told anyone this, but I want to tell you something. He says, fine, come. Sat down. He says, I'm going to tell you this. He said, what? He said, a couple of nights ago, I saw a dream. In my dream, I saw that Abu al-Fadl Abbas was sitting there and Imam Hussein was dictating him something. Right? There was a list there. And this was the list of those people who are the Azadar of Fatima alayhi salam. The list was there. It's being updated. He said that, but there was, there's a list with a higher level as well. For those people who recite for the sake of Ahlul Bayt. For those people, there's an entire hadith Allah Majlisi mentions. That once, one of the Imams said, he said, if a person recites and 40 people cry, Jannat becomes wajib upon them. He says, no, 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 no. He says, if 30 people cry, Jannah becomes wajib. And he says, no, 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 no. If 10 people cry, Jannah becomes wajib. And he brings it down to if one person cries, Jannah becomes wajib, right? But I look at the criteria. Criteria is a tough one. So here he says to Abbas, he says, cut this person's name out and put this other person's in. So Ayatollah Sayyid Abdul Hadi, Shir, Abdul Hadi Shirazi says, he saw, I saw the name of Sayyid Jafar on there. So I went to Sayyid Jafar the next day and I called him and I said, look, Imam Hussein's put your name on the reciters, but you don't recite. Sayyid Jafar said, look, when I was leaving, I thought to myself, I thought to myself that I've never really recited before. But I felt the urge to recite. 
So I went, I bought a maqtal from the shop, and I called my children, and I said, children, let me recite the masaib of Imam Hussein, and you cry. He said, the sincerity of this man was such, Imam Hussein asked for his name to be written down. But Atullah Wahid al-Khurasani said, there was other names on there as well. One of the names he cut out. Just because, and this is I say to myself, just because I feel that I may be a reciter, doesn't mean that my name is going to stay permanently on. Right? But remember one thing, if you give people food for the sake of Imam Hussein, if you give people water for the sake of Imam Hussein, if you give people water for the sake of Zahra alayhi salam, what does the hadith say? It says, Mashar will come. Jibreel will be waiting. Jibreel doesn't wait for anyone. And the hukum is then given. Ahl al-Mashar, lower your eyes. Why? Fatima bint Muhammad is coming on Mashar. The tradition says she comes like a bird comes and picks one by one each one of her Shia, each one of her Azadar one by one. She picks them like a bird picks grain. But you know what? When all of you are going towards heaven, then you're inspired and you say to Allah, Allah, show the world our status. And at that moment, then the reply comes, take everyone who's even given a glass of water for the sake of Zahra alayhi salam. This is why they say, contribute, help, do whatever you can for the sake of Imam Hussein. The biggest thing you can do is give time. People come, they write checks and they walk away. But how many people are going to be there cleaning? I've seen some of the most successful people you wouldn't believe. Within months, they've come from here to over there. Some of the leading professionals in your country, in your country, I don't want to mention any names, but because we travel extensively, some of the leading professionals in your country in their fields, even to this day when nobody's looking, go to the toilet and clean the toilet of the Husseiniyah. Then, why? Because they say this is Imam Hussein's home. And it's our responsibility to make sure Imam Hussein looks clean. This is, this is what inspires people then to have children like Sheikh Taqi Bahjad. Because you may think that it's not running in you, but what you're doing is having an asr on your generation to come. You know, if there's something negative that's going to go into your nasl, Allah removes that negativity and makes it positive. This is why they say it's the small things in life that count. So honestly, do those small things and implement those small things. Final thing is this then. Remember from the five signs I said. Five signs. The final sign is this. A person who has control over their temper. And sometimes the biggest problem for us is actually to control our temper. Religious, non-religious people. You've been told... When you walk through the door and you come into your house, what do you do? You leave all your stress behind. And what do some people in our community do? They take out the stress on their spouses, be it male or female, take out this stress on their spouses. This is haram. This is bad. This has effect. Have you not looked at the tradition where Rasulullah says that this is adab going on? says, but why Rasulullah? This person was with you. He says, adab is there because he used to trouble his wife. Trouble as children. You cannot reach the highest levels of ma'rifah until or unless you don't become one with your family. You know, we're so careful when it comes to meeting people from the outside. But when it comes to our own family, we take them for granted. Don't take your family for granted. Now let me give you a story. There's a prophet by the name of Bul Kifl. You go to Najaf, right? Take a taxi, 25 minutes away, there's a shrine. The shrine of Bul Kifl, Prophet Ezekiel. When you go into the shrine, you see that today the Hebrew writing is still there. Ahl Iraq has preserved the heritage, which is a good thing. The custodians of that shrine are now in the UK, and they're Iraqi Jews, who have a lot of love for Iraqi Shias. It's a lot of love there, because remember, when you eat together, when you live together, when you spend time together, then what happens? Love begins to form. This is why even when you live in your countries, Speak to people, talk to people, share with people, build that love, build that connection. This person who I'm telling you about, when it comes to this, and I said this before, when it comes to the Shahadat of Imam Musa ibn Jafar, messages me to say condolences. When the issue of Imam Hussein comes, he messages me to say, take your condolences. But what makes a person not from my faith, it's a Jewish man, to text me? And the reason why? Because he's lived there and he's seen the karamat of Ahlul Bayt. And the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, the Middle East once upon a time was a peaceful place. Right? Iraq was once a peaceful place where Jews and Muslims lived side by side. 
whenever the Jewish nation fell into problems in 1400 years, in the Middle East, they would come to Shia lands. Shias gave them respite. Why do you think today in Isfahan there's Jewish communities? In the time of the Safavis, the Safavis said, come in, don't worry about it. Because we'll look after you. The, way, the Shia way is always this, look after people. Whoever they are, whatever background they're from, look after people. You know why? You change hearts like that. Don't you know the story about the woman chucking rubbish on the Prophet? If the Prophet turned around and said, that's it, that woman wouldn't have come to Ahlul Bayt. That wouldn't have, woman wouldn't have come onto the part of Islam. Even when somebody wrongs you, you do right. Your Mawla Amir al muminin says, sitting there, Rasulullah asks a question to Fulan. He says, Fulan, what would you do if somebody did bad to you? He said, do bad back to them. So says so the other Fulan, he says, look, Fulan, what would you do? He says, I'd do good. What about if it happened a second time? He says, then, you know, obviously I'd have to retaliate. Third guy sitting there, same things, kind of replies. Rasulullah looks up at Amir al muminin says, Ya Ali, what would you do? He says, I would do good. What about if they did bad again? He says, I still do good to them. He said, if they did bad again to you, he said, I still do good to them. He goes, how long would you do good? He goes, as long as he can do bad, I can keep on doing my goodness. If he can't leave his bad habit, why should I leave my good habit? Amir al muminin is gharib, man. People have not understood who the imam is. Well, they understand who your imam is. How compassionate he is. How kind he is. Look at the way at night time. Have you not heard the stories? When Amir al muminin was hit on the head, the orphans found out that Ali requires milk. The night of the 20th, Small children came out with bowls in their hand outside the door of Imam Ali. He said, we have milk for you. This is all that we have. We'll stay hungry, but we want to make sure that our father is kept alive. See, this is what brings a person, even though they had nothing to eat or drink. What takes you to the stage where you come out as an orphan and say, look, why? Because Amir al muminin would hug them. He would play with them. He would feed them. Somebody asked a question. You know what the question was? They said, Ya Ali, why do you go every night to give food to people? Why don't you invite people to you? You know what he replied? He says, I invite my friends to me, but those people who don't like me, I go out to them to give them food. Wow. Now imagine. Look at your mola and just get, take lessons from this. It's not just stories. To become Amir al muminin Work towards that. You know, okay, we can never be Amir al-Mu'minin, but his sifat is there for us to copy. At least try and be like Amir al-Mu'minin. It's like what Allama Hilli said. Somebody asked him, they said, well, who did you want to be? He said, I wanted to be like Amir al-Mu'minin. That's why I became Allama Hilli. Right? He, goes, you're, he said to one of the kids, he said, look, you're looking to be me. You ain't going to be like me. You want to be like me? You've got to aim to be like Amir al-Mu'minin. That's when you can. Look at some of our greatest scholars. They lived the life of Amir al muminin They tried to anyway. Nobody can do. Nobody can do. But ishq of the Imam is such that you want to copy everything. Why? Because he's the beloved. True ashik is a person who copies the sifat. All they see is Amir al muminin Have you ever seen a kid in love? Okay, maybe some of our elders are past that stage. But some of our younger kids, when they're, they're continuously talking, my husband is this, my wife is that, and the day his wife goes away for even three days, the guy's crawling up the walls. Why? There's an ishq there. At least it happens for six months. After that, I can't give any guarantee. But no, but what do you do though? But bring it back now. If you love Amir al muminin then what? Everywhere you turn, you see Amir al muminin Ask Salman the question. Everywhere he turned, wherever he looked, he saw the face of Amir al muminin Right? Friends of Amir al muminin saw Amir al muminin but also in the battle of Badr, enemies of Amir al-Mu'minin saw Amir al-Mu'minin everywhere as well. They looked at the front, Amir al-Mu'minin was coming. They looked to the right, Amir al-Mu'minin was coming. They looked to the left, Amir al-Mu'minin was coming. Somebody says, Ya Rasulullah, what's the problem? Everywhere we're seeing Ali, 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 Ali. He replies, he says, the angels have come down in the form of Amir al-Mu'minin and they're fighting as well. <laughs> this is Amir al-Mu'minin. You know, you look at the man, look at his majesty. Look at His Majesty. They say that after 25 years, when Amir al-Mu'minin finally got his Khilafat, 
Saturday begins to walk into the masjid. Symbolism is very important. We'll discuss it tomorrow. Symbolism here is very important. It goes back to the primordial nature of man, symbolism. They say when he walked in, he had the shirt of Ibrahim, the one that he wore when he was chucked into the fire. He had the black cloak of the Prophet. He had the staff of Musa. Had the ring of Suleiman. Remember, within, within biblical studies, there's something known as Tabut al-Sakina. Within Tabut al-Sakina is what? The relics of the Prophets. That Tabut al-Sakina disappeared after the Temple of Solomon, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed it. Even afterwards, when Cyrus the Great remade the Second Temple, Tabut al-Sakina wasn't there anymore. People ask the question, where is Tabut al-Sakina? You don't find anywhere in history that those relics come out. The only time the relics of Tabut al-Sakina come out is when Amir al-Mu'mineen walks in to the masjid and he goes up the stairs of the masjid and he comes onto the member and he climbs one step and two step and three step, goes all the way to the top. He says, praise be to that Lord that finally Haq has come back on his place. Only Amir al-Mu'mineen can do that, right? So then he says, Saluni. Then he says, ask me. Uh, whatever you want, ask me before you lose me. So you find somebody stands up and he says, Amir al-Mu'mineen, tell us, how many hairs do I have on my head? The Imam says, even if I told you, you couldn't count it. But let me tell you something. In your house, Saad, in your house is a guy called Umar, your son. He will be the killer of my son. Saad ibn Abi Waqas asked the question. Amir al-Mu'mineen gave him the answer. He says, go to your house and see. There's a child in your house which will be the killer of my son, Hussein. This is Amir al-Mu'mineen. Ilm imamat, look at the basir of the imam. Imam didn't take any revenge there either. Imam could have, what does he say to Ibn Muljim? Ibn Muljim, you're giving me bayya, but I can see the day when this is covering this. Did he show bad akhlaq to Ibn Muljim? No. Did he slander Ibn Muljim? No. He calls pain to Ibn Muljim? No. He was the best person to Ibn Muljim. Why? This is called hujjat. Had he not been the best person, it would have meant that there's no mercy in the world. Allah's mercy flows from Amir al-Mu'mineen. This is what tells us that Allah is merciful. When you see the hujjat of Allah so merciful, then it tells us how merciful is your Lord. Look, my time is fast going. I know that 10 minutes were taken, but I still want to try and finish on time. I'm going to give you one final tradition. And then I'm going to move into today. So one day, Amir al Mu'minin, right? Standing in the center in the mosque. He says, ask me, whatever you want to ask me. Remember, nobody's given this idda. Nobody does this. Sixth Imam was asked, he said, are you not sahib is saluni? He says, listen, we have the same knowledge of imamat, but saluni is only for Ajad Ali. Oh. Allah has taken upon himself that whoever says saluni, Allah will disgrace them. Oh. Right? So you've heard the story, Sipta Josie. Sipta Josie is a very famous scholar. One day he thought to himself, look, you know, I... Got a lot of knowledge in my chest. So he comes onto the member, he says, Saluni. That's the last thing you want to say. Man gets up. He says, I got a question. He says, What is your question? He says that, in fact, no, the tradition says it was a woman who got up. She asked the question. She said, Look, you know, is it wajib to bury a person after they die? He says, Of course it's wajib. He says, can I ask you a question? He says, what? Why was so-and-so's body lying there for six days and nobody of the Sahabi were burying him? So when she said that, he got angry. He said, curse be on your husband if he's allowed you to come here without him or curse be on you if you've left the house without his permission. So she looks up and she says, can you tell me another question, please? Did so-and-so leave her house with the permission of her husband or without the permission of her husband? Now, half of you, I don't know, didn't get that. Think about Battle of Jamal and then get back to me. <laughs> right, now you got it. Rasada Salawat, please.
takes his amama, chucks it on the floor. After that, he never came onto the member again. That's what happens when you try and imitate Amir al Right? So, that, you know, Amir al Mu'minin was sitting there and he thought to himself, you know, he's asking the question again now. They say an old man was there, he walks in. Haybat and Jalal. And he says to himself, my mawla is asking a question. And these people are asking stupid questions. Comes forward, he looks up, face was light. He says, Ya Ali, can you tell me where Jibreel is? So Amir al Mu'minin looks to the right. All of reality one way. He said, Jibreel is not there. He looks to the left. All of reality that way. He said, Jibreel is not there. Looks forward, backwards, up, down. Looks at him and he goes, I've seen all of creation from the beginning to the end. I can't find Jibreel anywhere. There's only two people left. Me and you. I'm Ali ibn Abi Talib. Therefore, you must be Jibreel. So the hadith says all of a sudden Jibreel goes up, the dome opens, he flies or whatever it was, the light goes up, closes again. So one monafik looks at another one and says, what was the point of Jibreel to show off like that? In the way that he came in, he could have gone out as well. And you think to yourself, some people are never happy. That is enough of a sign for me to say, fine, this is haq. Right? But remember what we said, eyes have to be open and the heart. Purification of the soul needs to be there. What is the best way of purification? Tears for the sake of Ahlul Bayt. Right? I'll give you a story. You know, tonight, many of you are here because you have Aqeed on Abul Fadl al Abbas. I know many of you are just waiting for the Messiah to come and for you to cry. I'm not here to hold you back. For our community, Abul Fadl al Abbas is such that our mothers have taught us. Son, whenever you have a problem, go under the alam of Abbas. I'm not here to hold you back. I'm going to recite today for as long as you want me to recite. For as long as I can recite, as long as my heart can take it. But before I get to that point, I just want to say one thing. There was a guy by the name of Haji Muhammad Ali. Haji Muhammad Ali was famous because he would take groups to Ziyara. One day, he ends up going to Hajj with the intention, I want to meet my Imam. The, just the one day before the death of Arafah, when the Hajjis go there, he comes onto the plain of Arafah and he goes inside of a tent and he's waiting there. And as he's waiting there, when he looks up, there was obviously nobody there. He sees one man. Man had a green shawl over his head and that man is walking towards him. When the man walks towards him, both of them say, Salam. And so the Haji said, look, you know, this guy looks like a Sayyid. He's a Sayyid. Let me ask him a question. He says to him, can you tell me something? He says, what? He says, you seem to be knowledgeable. He says, yes, ask me. He says, where's Imam Zaman? The reply comes. He says, Imam Zaman is in a tent. And he stops there. He asks him the next question. He said, is Imam Zaman going to be here for Arafat tomorrow? He says, Imam Zaman is going to be here for Arafat tomorrow. He says, where is he going to be? He says, around the hudud of Jabal al-Rahma. This is where Hussein ibn Ali gave his khutbah. So that is where it's going to be. So he begins to continue. He says, can I ask you another question? He says, yes. Do you think that the Imam will come to us tomorrow when we're doing the Amal of Arafah? He looks up and he says, yes. The Imam will come, but he will only come when he recite the Masaib of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. Man leaves, all of a sudden, Haji Muhammad Ali realizes, hang on a minute, he knew my name, he was speaking in my dialect, I understood him completely, he was answering all my questions, he starts hitting his head on the floor. He said, this was my mola, but then he remembered one thing. He said, but when a person recites the Messiah of Abbas, then even Imam Zaman comes. Right? Tonight, just remember, you don't know who's next to you. They say that morning came, Arafah came. Arafah came, he forgot to tell his people about Abdul Fadl Abbas's Masaib. All of a sudden, the Wa'iz begins to recite the Masaib of Abdul Fadl Abbas. As he recites it, this man realizes, where's my Mola? My Mola said he was coming. His heart begins to beat. 
He's thinking, where's my mola? When's he going to come? He says, let me go outside of the tent and see where my mola is. When he went outside of the tent, your Imam Zaman was holding the piece of the tent and he was standing outside and crying. He was crying. He didn't want to disturb you. He was standing out there crying. Why? Because even Imam has a qidah on Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. <laughs> Bab al-Hawaj. You've come to the right place today. You've come to Bab al-Hawaj today. Give you one more story and then we'll go into what we need to go into. One more story. There was a man. His mother was very sick. He takes her to the shrine of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas. One Ayatollah says, I was watching that this young man has brought his mother. You know, imagine old mother, you carry your old mother to the shrine of Abbas. And he was saying to Abbas, cure my mother, cure my mother, cure my mother. And he said, I was watching the whole night. This man was shaking the zari, he was repenting, he was asking monajat. He was thinking, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? He said, I sat there watching to see what's going to happen. He said, eventually a time came when this man was losing a bit of hope. This young man gets up and I said to him, look, go and prepare ghusl and coffin for your mother because she's about to die. He looks at me and he says, Sheikh, I wouldn't come to Abbas if I thought my mother was going to die. I wouldn't come to Abbas if I thought my mother was going to die. Sheikh sits back, he says, look, this guy's really got some emotions. Let's see what happens. Eventually, a time comes when his mother's not getting better. This young man gets up and he begins to walk. And as he begins to walk with tears in his eyes, he looks at the shrine of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas and he just says one thing. He says, Mola, I'm going to your father, Amir al-Mu'minin, to complain that you haven't given shafa to my mother. As he begins to go, and as he goes to the hudud of Karbala, a man is riding behind him and that man cuts him off. When he cuts him off, he says, come back and see. Your mother has recovered again. Your mother has recovered again. He says, how do you know? He says, just come back and see. Boy turns around, young man turns around. When he gets there, he sees his mother was walking. So he says to the rider, he says, oh rider, you gave me good news. Can I shake your hands? The rider looks up, he says, my brother, I don't have any hands to give you. Tonight, the flag of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas is going to come out. It's going to be brought into this hall. I want to recite one more story in relation to the flag of Abbas, then I'm coming on to the Masaib of Abbas. In 2007, some of us will know this. I recited this once before in another place. 2007, there was a Rajput, and the Rajput couldn't have any children. One of my friend's eyewitness account from Lucknow tells me this. He says the Rajput couldn't have any children. Ten years had gone. Him and his wife come to the, when the Jalus of Abbas is coming, when the procession of Abbas is coming, they come both of them. Husband says to the wife, my mother told me that when none of your prayers are being accepted, just go under the flag of Abbas and grab the flag of Abbas and ask. So he says to his wife, he says, we've gone everywhere and tried everything. This is our final resort. We're going to Abbas. So he says that when the flag of Abbas came out in the Jalus, he goes on and he grabs it. And all of us, this emotion comes in play. My friend said I was watching. He said he grabbed onto the alam of Abbas and he said, Abbas, my mother said to me that whenever I have a problem, I should go under your flag. I don't have a bigger problem than this. I don't have a child. Abbas, give me a son. And if you give me a son, I'll bury him in your way. Right? Nine months later, Allah gave him a son. 2008, Allah gave him a son. Heavy hearted, he remembered what he made promises to Abbas. And he said to himself, I'm a Rajput. The promises that I make, I'm going to keep those promises. But he waited because he knew his wife was now a new mother. He could see her holding the baby in her hands. He could see her kissing the baby. At nighttime, he grabs the baby and he begins to walk. And as he walks, he digs a small grave. He puts the baby in the grave. 
he said, I felt so bad. My heart was hurting because the baby was holding onto my clothes. It was holding onto my finger. It was smiling. Somehow I put the baby in and I started filling the sand over the baby. Heavy hearted, I was standing just outside of my house thinking, how am I going to go in? That eventually I opened the door when I went and I could hear a baby's voice coming from another room. I went into the room, I saw my wife was holding a baby in her hands. So I said to her, I said, why are you holding this baby for? Why are you holding this baby for? Did you follow me? I went to bury it because this was my promise. She says, my husband, I didn't follow you. Half an hour after you left, there was a knock on the door. When I opened the door, there was a very tall man standing there. He had a baby with him. When he gave me the baby, he said to me, tell your husband, what we Ahlul Bayt give, we don't take back. <laughs> they say that when Bashir came, when Bashir came to Medina, he gave a voice. The voice was Qad Qutl al Hussein bi Karbala. They said, Ummul Banin was sitting in the sahan. She says to Fadl, she says, Fadl, give me my stick. She grabs the stick and she stands up. And the tradition says she looks towards Najaf and she just says one thing. She says, Sayyidi wa Mawlai, forgive me that my son Abbas wasn't able to help you, Hussein. She says to Fadl, Fadl, let's go outside. They begin to walk. They come to Bashir. As they come to Bashir, they ask Bashir a question. Ummul Banin says, she says, what Hussein do you talk about that was killed in Karbala? He replied, he says, Hussein, the son of Zahra. She looks up and she says, I don't think that it's the right Hussein. Says, why? Says, because my Abbas was with him. He says, but Abbas was killed in Karbala. Replies and says, but... I can't believe that Abbas was killed. No mother has born a son like Abbas. I can't believe Abbas was killed. He replies, this is, but Abbas was hit from the back of the head. Says, but I raised Abbas. Abbas can't be attacked from the front or the back. Abbas can defend himself. The reply came, but Abbas had no arms. His right arm was chopped off. His left arm was chopped off. So Ummul Banin just asked one question. She falls to the ground and then she gets up and she says, she says, Bashir, tell me, when my son Abbas fell to the ground, he had no arms to support him. Did his chest hit the floor first or did his head hit the floor? At that moment, she says, Fadl, I'm going alone now to a broken grave. Don't follow me. Don't follow me. Ummul Banin goes to a broken grave, sits on the broken grave, touches the dirt of the grave, and just says one thing. She says, Zahra, please forgive me, but my son wasn't treacherous to your son. He gave his life first. I say to Ummul Banin one thing. Your Abbas fell once, if his chest hit or his head hit. But what about Zainab? Her arms were tied behind her back. Every time she fell, ask yourself the question, did her chest hit or did her head hit? <laughs> 11th of, 11 AH comes, 11 Hijra comes. Zahra is leaving this world. As she leaves this world, Amir al muminin is sitting there with her. You know what she says? She says, Abul Hassan, I have some wasiyas to give you. She says, what are those wasiyas, Zahra? You know what she says? Honestly, it breaks my heart. She puts her hands together. She says, Abul Hassan, forgive me if I've ever wronged you. <laughs> so Amir al muminin begins to cry. He says, Zahra, you and wrong me? He begins to cry. Second question. Second question. Zahra looks up and again says something. She says, Abul Hassan, I'm moving very fast, says Abul Hassan. If ever my son Hussein at night times feel thirsty, please wake up and get him some water. <laughs> Abul Hassan, my Zainab is very small. Protect my Zainab. Tradition continues. And then it comes to a point where she says, and Abul Hassan, if ever you get an opportunity ever in your life 
please do come regularly to my grave and give me salam. <laughs> Zahra was missing Amir al Mu'minin. <laughs> do come regularly to give salam on my grave. Amir al Mu'minin, with tears in his eyes, says, He says, Zahra, on one condition, says, What is that? When I give salam, you reply to me. <laughs> then she concludes and she says, She says, Give my salam to two people. Says, Who are they? She says, give my salam to Abbas when he comes. <laughs> Zahra passes away from this world. Amir al-Mu'mineen marries Ummul Banin. You know the day when he marries Ummul Banin, right? When she was coming home, all of Banu Hashim had taken out their swords. Ummul Banin comes from under the swords. She goes, the, she doesn't go inside the house though. She comes and she sits on the doormat of Amir al-Mu'mineen's house. <laughs> Say that Zainab Umm Kulsum come. They say, Mother, why aren't you going inside of the house? She replies, she says, how can I go into the house where Fatima to Zahra used to be? <laughs> says, I'm coming in this house as a slave. I'm not coming in this house as your mother. Zainab grabs one arm. Umm Kulsum grabs one arm. They take Umm al into the house. They say from that day onwards, Amir al muminin redid one dua for 10 years. Every time he got to the Musalla, he said, Allah, give me a son Abbas. Give me a son Abbas. Give me a son Abbas. Father's dua 10 years later, Abbas comes into the world. Umm al was lying there with Abbas. She puts him in white parchment and she leaves Abbas there. Amir al muminin walks in, opens up the parchment. Kisses a bass on the right arm, <laughs> then kisses a bass on the left arm. Umm al Banin begins to cry. She says, Mola, I've seen when all of your children are born, you kiss them on the forehead. Is it because my son is the son of a slave that you kiss him on the right arm and you kiss him on the left arm? Amir al says, No, you don't know. His right arm will be sacrificed for my Hussein. And his left arm will be sacrificed for Hussein. Right. One day Amir al-Mu'mineen walks in. Abbas was two years old. When he walks in, he sees Zainab is holding one hand. Umm Kulsum was holding the other hand. They were training Abbas how to walk. So Amir al-Mu'mineen gets happy. He looks up and he says, look at my daughters today teaching my son to walk. Zainab looks up and she replies, father, today we're learning to walk under Abbas's shadow. Abbas. <laughs> Many people have come, they said, for dua. Do you know how your dua can be answered? I'm going to give you three ways that your dua will be answered. Nobody should leave her without their dua being answered. Imam says, alayhi salam, he says, if ever you have a problem, ask three, take wasilas, three wasilas from my uncle Abbas. And you'll see my uncle Abbas will answer you. They ask Mullah, what is it? Says that first wasila, if your dua is not being answered, first wasila is this. Ask Abbas for the earrings of Sakina. <laughs> and if you have any doubt, ask for the hijab of Zainab. <laughs> but remember, ask from the Ummul Banin as well. I haven't even recited the Masai of Abbas yet. I haven't recited the Masai. I'm trying to think how am I going to recite Abbas's Masai. I know your Aqidah, I know my Aqidah. It's very difficult. I'm just going to give you one more tradition then. You know what that tradition is? Look, I'm accelerating everything. Just one tradition. Ninth of Muharram comes. Sayyidu Shuhada says to Abul Fadl Abbas. Go to the enemy and ask for one day. A man with a ghayra, imagine how difficult it is for him to go and ask for one day. Tradition says Zuhair bin Qain was with him. They were riding. And as they were riding the horse, Zuhair begins to speak to Muslim. Both of them are conversing. One says to the other, do you remember the day when Ali got married to Umm al -Banin? And Ali was saying that I'm going to have a son Abbas who's going to help Hussein. When Abu Fadl Abbas heard this, both of his hands, he grabs the horse and he pulls the horse. <laughs> pulls the horse and he stops it. He says, Zuhair, just go to my Mola and just say to him for me to go and fight. By Fajr time, I'll take this army out. 
How difficult is it for that man to go to Umar ibn Sa'd and say, just give us one more. One more night. One more night. Two more traditions. Two more traditions. Perhaps I won't be able to recite them, but I'll recite them. Ashura day is going to come. Just remember, Abbas went just before Asr time, just before Sayyid al Shahada. Tradition says Abbas was standing there watching. The day began. One Shaheed comes back. Abbas's hand on his own his sword. The next Shaheed comes back. Abbas's hand is on his sword. Every time he goes up to Mola, he says, Mola, please give me the ijazah to go into the battlefield. He says, Abbas, you don't have ijazah. Banu Hashim come. The body, it says in the tradition, the body of Ali Akbar comes back. He says, Abbas says, this is a person I trained with my own hands. Mola, give me the ijazah to go. I can't see me carrying these students of mine. Qasim comes back. On and Muhammad come back. Tradition says, one by one, everyone comes back. Abbas is thinking, what am I going to do? At the moment of the time when he's thinking, what am I going to do? He looks towards a tent and he sees a four-year-old girl. And the four-year-old girl picks up a water container. She shakes the container. She puts the coldness on her lips. She puts the coldness on her head. And she's saying, Al-Atash, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. Abbas goes forward. He says, Sakina, do you want some water? Reply says, I want some water. Says, go and say to your father to let me into the battlefield. Sakina goes running. She says, father, let Abbas go into the battlefield. Tradition says she comes back. As she comes back, she says to all of the children, children, get your water containers because my uncle Abbas is going to get the water. Tradition says now, Sayyid al-Shuhada looks towards his brother. Old, for old brother goes forward, puts his arms on the shoulders of Abbas. Says, Abbas, you're going, you're going. But Abbas knows something. What's going to happen to my daughter after you? <laughs> Hadith says, Abbas gets onto his horse. As he gets onto his horse, Sayyid al-Shuhada looks up and he says something. Old brother says to his younger brother, he says, all of your life, Zainab has raised you. Can you go and give your final farewell to your sister? Abbas turns his horse around, goes to the tent of Zainab. Zainab comes out. She says, brother, can you get off the horse just for one minute and come into my tent? Abbas gets off the horse, goes into the tent. Zainab says, Abbas, can you put your knees on the ground? Puts her knees on the ground. Zainab puts both of her arms around Abbas and she begins to cry. She says, my father told me that my hijab was going to be taken off. I believed him, but I didn't know how this was going to happen. Abbas, now that you're going, I know my hijab's not safe anymore. Abbas, just give me one minute. She turns around. She says, oh, women of Banu Hashim, today I can't promise now that your hijab is going to be salim. I'm reciting slowly because I know some of you can't take it. If I knew you could take it, I would recite all of the Messiah of Abbas. Abbas gets on a horse and he begins to ride. You know the tradition says? Ulama asked, what was it that Imam Hussein took away from Abbas? Sixth Imam replies, he said, My Ammu Abbas had Nafathul Basira. When he looked at somebody, he could kill them. Imam Hussein took the power away. Abbas begins to write. They say that slowly he comes to the Furat. He gets off his horse. He says to his horse, drink. The horse turns his face away. When he looked into his eyes, the horse had tears in his eyes. <laughs> Abbas grabs the water. Abbas gets on the horse. Abbas now begins to ride. All Abbas wants is to bring this water back to Sakina. My heart can't recite anymore, but I'm going to take you back to the tents. A small girl was sitting there. All the other children were gathered there. She was saying, my Ammu Abbas is coming. My Ammu Abbas is coming. She was watching the flag. She says, look at the flag. The flag is coming. The flag slowly begins to move forward. As the flag moves forward, 
all of a sudden, the flag falls to the right hand side. Sakina grabs the water containers, chucks it on the floor. Small hands lifts up. She says one thing, children, you say Ameen, I'm going to pray. She says, Allah, I don't want water anymore. Just bring back my uncle Abbas. Flag comes up again. Sakina says, Alhamdulillah. Flag again goes to the left side. As it begins to go to the left side, Sakina turns her face away. All of a sudden, the tradition says something. What does the tradition say? It says when Abbas was riding, as he was riding, as he was riding, he had the water container in his mouth. One man came, chopped off his right hand. He moved the to the left hand. Left arm went. Abbas was holding the water container in his mouth. And as he was going, Hurmala said to Mukhtar, I took the arrow. When I fired the arrow, just before I fired, I saw Abbas look at the skies. You know, when a man does dua, he lifts his arms up. Abbas didn't have any hands to lift. He lifted his head up to the skies. He said, Allah, make sure this water gets back. A voice comes, Abbas, we've not accepted your dua. Abbas looks up and says, Mola, Allah, if you haven't accepted my dua, then I have another dua. Voice comes, Abbas, we've made you Babul Hawaj. For anyone who comes to your door, for anyone who comes to your door, your Babul Hawaj, you can answer them. So then he says, Allah, make sure my body never gets back because I feel haya from Sakina. Because I feel haya from Sakina. When he fell on the ground, when the arrow was in his eye, Abbas fell and he gives his final salam. He says, Mola, accept my final salam. Gharib Hussein, Mazloom Hussein, holding his back, begins to walk onto the maqtal. Hussein trips, he falls onto the ground, then he lifts himself up again. He trips again, he walks towards again. When he gets there, Abbas had blood in one eye and an arrow in the other eye. Abbas just says one thing, oh person who's coming, kill me later but give me some minutes my mola is coming and my mother said to me that when i was born i did ziyarah of my mola now that i'm dying i want to do ziyarah of my mola and my hussein comes forward he says abbas i'm hussein he says i'm hussein imam hussein puts both of his knees on the ground of karbala abbas just says one thing it was very painful you know what abbas says he says, Mola, my mother said to me that when I was born, I did your ziyara. Mola, I wouldn't have given you the zahma at all. But there's blood in my eye. I can't see you properly. Do you mind removing the blood from my eyes? I don't have any arms to remove it, otherwise I would have done it myself. Sayyidu Shahada, tears in his eyes, grabs his abba, begins to remove the blood from the eyes of Abu al-Fadl Abbas. Final story and that's it. Ayatollah Yahya Yathrubi narrates. Ayatollah Yahya Yathrubi narrates. He says, one day I was in Karbala. One wise was on the mimbar. He was reciting that an arrow went into the eye of Abbas. He says, I felt so sad. I fell to the ground. When the wise got up, I said to the wise, look at my age. Look what you're reciting. How do you know the arrow actually went into the eye of Abbas? Don't recite that again. He said that night when he went to sleep, Yahya Yathrubi says, when I closed my eyes, I saw Abu al-Fadl Abbas come to me. He said, why did you stop my wise from reciting this? He says, Mala, just in case the hadith was wrong. He says the hadith wasn't wrong. The arrow did go into my eye. He says the arrow went into my eye. He says, but Yahya Yathrubi, when something goes into a person's eye, it's very painful. Abbas said, the arrow was hurting me in my eye. It was so painful. I didn't have any arms to take it out. So I was moving my body from right to left to remove the arrow from my eyes. I was moving right to left. It was so painful. I wanted to call Hussein, but I knew Hussein was alone and Zainab was there. When I didn't have anyone to help me, I put my head between my knees to pull out the arrow. As I put my head between my knees to pull out the arrow, it was hurting me. It was hurting me. The pain was a lot. When the pain got a lot, 
when the pain got a lot, I didn't know what to do. I looked towards Najaf. I said, Father, come and help me because this arrow is hurting me. Father, come and help me. Martin El Sain. Alam of Abbas is coming. I am 
अब की सदाई अब्बास कहा सब पढ़े नाम मौला चलते हुए थे मोसे जैनब की सदाई अब्बास कहा हो तो चलते हुए थे मोसे जैनब की सदाई अब्बास कहा हो तो ना सर पे रही चादर ना मेरा बचा भाई अब्बास कहा हो तो चलते हुए खैमो से जैनब की सदाई अब्बास कहा हो तो चलते हुए खैमो से जैनब की सदाई अब्बास कहा हो तो ना सर पे रही चादर ना सर पे रही चादर ना मेरा बचा भाई अब्बास कहा हो तो चलते हुए है मोसे जैनब की सदाई अब्बास कहा हो जलते हुए खैमो से जैनब की सदाई अब्बास कहा हो तो जलते हुए खैमो से जैनब की सदाई ना सर पे रही जा 
चादर रही चादर ना मेरा बचा भाई अब्बास कहा हो तू चलते हुए पैरों से जैनब की सदा से वफा है सपा 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 
पार बेटा है तू अली का झारा की तू दुआ है शबीर तेरा का उमुल बनी ने माँ है हर सूरत तो चलने में है दर से ना जुदा है तुझसे कायम दुनिया में बस वफा है अपा सपा 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 तेरे अलम को थामे हर शख्स कह रहा है मजलू में करबला का जैनब का वासता है पर दिस कोई ऐसा पर दिस मीना उजरे सद के में उसके जिससे का घर बार लुट गया उसे वक्त जब कि जैनब दरबार में गई थी कारी नमाजियों से महफिल सजी हुई थी जाल में पूछता था गाजी तेरा कहाँ है बालों से मुँह छुपाए जैन अब ये कह रही थी अबा सपा 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 शाम गरीब मेज से का कुर्ता जल गया है कानों से बालियाँ भी खेश मरे ले गया है इस बेकसी से मौला बची कोई ना तर पे फर्श हजा पे रो कर हर हर दिल ये कह रहा है अबा सपा 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 अबा से तुझ से कितनी मानू से थी सकीना बाबा के बाद तेरे पर चम को माना सीना मासूम वो काली तो तुझ से बिचड़ के गाजी बस कहती मर गई है जिंदान में हजीना पा मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो तेरी जागीर से चल परा काफिला मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो ए मेरे बाबफा है बहन बेरदा मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो तेरी जागीर से चल बड़ा काफिला मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो तुझको दे के बिना चैन आता नहीं नो के न जाप सर तेरा मिलता नहीं मैं जियारत करूँ किस तरह ये बता मेरे गाजी कहाँ हो तेरी जागीर से 
چل پرا قافلا میرے آزی کہاں ہو لاج رکھ لو بہن کی برادر میرے خاک مکتل میرے سر کا پیدا بنے حکم دے دو ذرا منتظر ہے ہوا میرے غازی کہا ہو تیری جاگیر سے چل رہا قافلہ میرے غازی کہا ہو تیرے بازو مجھے راستے میں ملے میں نے چادر سمجھ کر وہ سر پر رکھے بازوں سے تیرا پوچھتی ہوں پتا میرے غازی کہاں ہو تیری جاگیر سے چل پرا کافلہ میرے غازی کہاں دیکھ کر بہن کو دشت میں ننگ سر کیا ہیا گئی چھپ گئے ہو کدھر خود چلی آونگی تم بتا دو ذرا میرے غازی کہاں ہو میرے غازی کہاں ہو السلام علیکہ یا عبداللہ السلام علیکہ یا ابن رسول اللہ السلام علیکہ یا ابن امیر المومنین و ابن سید الوسیین السلام علیکہ یا ابن فاطمہ تزارہ سید تنیس العالمین السلام علیکہ ماکہ جمعین و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ السلام علیکہ یا غریب الغربہ السلام علیکہ یا مونوز و فائب الفقرہ السلام علیکہ شمش الشموس السلام علیکہ نیس النفوس السلام علیکہ یا ایوہ رضا راضی والقد والقضا السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ السلام علیکہ یا صاحب الاسس والزمان السلام علیکہ خلیفہ الرحمان السلام علیکہ امام الانسی والجان السلام علیکہ مظلیمان السلام علیکہ یا شریک القرآن عج اللہ تعالیٰ فرجک حسال اللہ مخجک و ظہورک السلام علیکم ورحمت اللہ وبرکاتہ